So hi everyone, welcome to another week of the Conservation Sciences um, Seminar Series. So uh, before we get started, um, just a few housekeeping. Uh, if you guys do have any questions, we'll have a QA and a after, but feel free to drop questions uh, in the chat as they come up or hold your question till the end and uh, be brave and unmute yourself and ask your question, Zoom face to Zoom face. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lainey Bryce. So Lainey is a wildlife ecologist working as a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell. She received her master's degree from the University of St. Andrews in marine mammal science and her PhD in ecology from Utah State University, where she was advised by Dr. Dan McNulty. Her research largely focuses on the role of large terrestrial carnivores as instigators of ecosystem change, specifically exploring when and how such predators uh, cause trophic cascades and the influence of climate-induced changes on these processes. She has previously investigated the extent to which wolf reintroduction affected aspen regeneration in Yellowstone National Park, and is currently working to determine how predator reintroduction would affect deer overpopulation and forest regeneration in New York. She's an alum of the Climate Adaptation Science Program at Utah State, where she researched the myriad effects of climate change on BLM land as well as how climate change will affect amphibian habitat across northern Yellowstone. So without further ado, uh, Lainey, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate it. Um, share my screen. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so first of all, thank you everyone for having me and sharing your time with me today. I super appreciate it. I'm really excited to talk to you about my work in Yellowstone, where I was looking at the potential effects of wolves on Aspen. There we go. So just before I get started, I wanna note that all of the work that I'm talking about today um, has been done in collaboration with Drs. Eric Larson and Dan McNulty. So Eric started collecting data on Aspen um, in Yellowstone in the 90s, and he's gone out every year by himself usually um, doing all this work. And really he's made this whole project possible. And then Dan is my doctoral advisor at Utah State, so he's been integral to this whole project. And we've also had tons of collaboration and help from the National Park Service, both the scientists and technicians. So anytime you hear me say we <laughs> throughout this presentation, generally these are the people I am referring to. All right, so my research centers on a fundamental challenge in ecology, which is to understand the forces that structure ecosystems and food webs. So the common view, both within science and among the public, is that large carnivore structure food webs. By structure, I mean they affect the number of species at different uh, trophic levels and their relative abundances. So just to demonstrate this mechanism, here's a simple three-level food chain. We have carnivores that consume herbivores or maybe change their behavior in some way, and then herbivores consume plants and the interactions between the adjacent levels in this food chain are considered to be direct. But when the direct effect of a carnivore on an herbivore trickles down to affect a plant, there's an indirect interaction, and this is what we call a trophic cascade. So there are three lines of evidence that we need to demonstrate to show a trophic cascade is occurring. First, there needs to be evidence that a carnivore suppresses herbivore abundance and or foraging behavior that this results in a reduction in herbivory, and ultimately the carnivore indirectly increases plant abundance. And there are two main ways that this can happen. So first, either through direct killing of prey, so a predator would directly reduce herbivore density, and we call this a density-mediated indirect effect. And the other mechanism is through a risk effect. So here, the presence of a predator uh, might result in a shift in prey habitat use or foraging behavior or an increase in vigilance. And this is what we call a trait mediated indirect effect. The potential for large carnivores to cause trophic cascades is commonly used as a tool uh, in both management and conservation around the world. So just as some examples, jaguars were recently reintroduced in Argentina. Wild dogs have been reintroduced to Mozambique. And there's lots of talk and a proposal to potentially reintroduce lynx to Scotland. But it is notoriously hard to measure large carnivore effects across landscapes. And that means that we don't have a complete understanding of predator effects and their management and conservation use. 
So what do we actually not know? Well, broadly, it's difficult to determine if and when a trophic cascade will happen, how um, it'll happen, so what is the mechanism, and the strength of those indirect effects. We also uh, often overlook humans as predators, even though we tend to kill uh, the most reproductively valuable individuals in a population at a much greater rate than other carnivores. And this makes us a potential super predator. So a perfect example of the challenge of quantifying predator effects across a landscape comes from Yellowstone. So very famously, wolves are reintroduced to the park in the 90s. And then there were subsequent changes observed to elk populations and uh, plants across the landscape. And I'm sure many of you have seen a cartoon like this before. So what most people think about wolf reintroduction and the story that's been largely broadcast uh, is that before wolves, we had a landscape that was dominated by elk and there wasn't a lot else. So you don't see any riparian vegetation here. And if you look in the back at this aspen stand, there's no regeneration in the bottom. Um, and the story is that when wolves were reintroduced, it brought about widespread sweeping changes. So in this second panel here, you see lots of other wildlife species. There's riparian vegetation that's helping to stabilize the riverbank. And if we look in the back here, there's aspen regeneration. And this example, like I said, has been broadly, broadly publicized uh, both in peer-reviewed journals and in the popular press. And it's used as a justification for predator reintroduction or removal around the world. And it is a really lovely story. It'd be great if it, if it was this easy, <laughs> but in reality, um, the system is much more complex. So this is an example of the food web in Yellowstone. And we have wolves that prey on elk, but there are also several other predator species um, that specifically prey on elk, and that includes people. And untangling this food web is a challenge, which is why we're still asking nearly 30 years after wolf reintroduction, how have wolves affected ecosystem structure? I'm simplifying the food web down to a single chain of wolves, elk, and aspen. And we're instead simplifying the question to how have wolves affected aspen regeneration since they were reintroduced? So why aspen? Aspen is one of the few woody deciduous plants in this system, and it's a really good habitat for a wide range of species. So it provides habitat for more species in surrounding conifer forests. But Aspen has been in decline in the park and really across the West uh, for quite some time. So for example, this is aerial imagery of an Aspen stand in Lamar Valley, which is the heart of wolf habitat in Yellowstone. And it's essentially vanished in the last 50 years. So if we look at the far left panel in 1954, all of this is Aspen. Uh, and then in 92, you see some scattered trees left. And by 2015, it's completely gone. Elk herbivory is one thing that's thought to drive Aspen decline. So elk are mainly grazers, but they supplement their winter diet with young aspen. And as you can see from some of these camera trap photos from some of our stands, elk mainly eat the woody tissue of young aspen in winter. So if they browse the top of the plant, they actually remove height and that might suppress growth and recruitment into adulthood. And just a note that when I say aspen throughout this presentation, I'm referring to young aspen, so all of this regeneration here. So we really are only looking at uh, aspen that are less than six meters tall. And if you're curious, this is what a heavily browsed young aspen looks like when we go out to measure it in summer. Um, our aspen are quite shrubby, which happens after repeated browsing. And you can see these stems sticking up have all been chewed off in wintertime. So there's also uncertainty about how Aspen has changed since wolf reintroduction. So we have some stands that look like this, where there's really no young Aspen and all of these logs uh, are now dead Aspen. So it's essentially an Aspen graveyard. But we also have stands that look like this uh, with tons of Aspen regeneration. All of these plants down here are Aspen uh, that are growing and doing well. We also don't have clear evidence of the mechanism um, or strength of this wolf-driven cascade. So wolves could either um, reduce elk survival, which would uh, cause a density-mediated indirect effect, 
or they could uh, alter elk habitat selection or increase vigilance, which would be our trait mediated indirect effect. And the dominant hypothesis in this system is that it is a trait mediated effect driving changes to Aspen. So all of this uncertainty brings us to what I'm talking about today, my research, which uh, seeks to answer this question, what is the strength and mechanism of the indirect effect of wolves on Aspen and Yellowstone? And to answer this question, there are three key components that we're looking at. So first is that occurrence. So are there trends in Aspen herbivory and growth that are consistent with the trophic cascade? Second, what is the dominant mechanism of this potential cascade? And third, what is the actual strength? So let's quantify the indirect effect of wolves on Aspen. All right, so first part, we're going to look at whether the change in Aspen herbivory and recruitment uh, is actually consistent with the trophic cascade. So is there any evidence at all, just the, the first baseline, do patterns uh, match with a potential cascade? So there are two steps to this, the two goals. Uh, first, we wanted to investigate how sampling bias in previous research has affected our understanding of the wolf elk aspen trophic cascade. And second, we wanted to clarify annual trends in aspen herbivory and recruitment using random sampling. So annual trends in height and browsing, and then we also have trends in wolves and elk are the main lines of evidence uh, that have been published to tie wolves to Aspen and provide evidence for a trophic cascade. But most of the published work that relies on uh, these trends uses non-random sampling. So there are three data sets that most of the Aspen cascade work is based on. And these three are based on non-random sampling. So these three data sets have garnered over 1800 citations and lots of attention. And we can compare this to two other studies that um, used random sampling and they get just a fraction of the citations. So I keep saying non-random sampling. Specifically what I'm referring to is a practice of measuring just the five tallest individuals in an Aspen stand. So the issue here is that you're only measuring the best performing individuals in the population. And we don't know if it's representative of changes across Northern Yellowstone as a whole. So we used random sampling to reassess the state of Aspen and Yellowstone um, and basically determine are the patterns that have been published, is that consistent with what we see with random sampling? So most of the research on the Yellowstone Trophic Cascade, uh, regardless if we're talking about Aspen or anything, it occurs on Yellowstone's Northern Range. So it's this blue polygon up here, and this is where the Northern Elk Herd spends its winter. Another important thing to note about the Northern Range is that it spans park boundaries, meaning part of the elk population is inside the park during winter and the other part of it is out and it's exp exposed to human harvest up, um, outside. So this graph is showing the proportion or the number of elk inside versus outside of the park um, over the last couple of decades. And you can see that the proportion has changed. However, this is still a single elk population. So it's exposed to large carnivores inside, um, inside the park and some outside, but mostly inside. And then elk outside of the park boundary are exposed to hunting. All of our Aspen sampling though is done inside the park. So starting in 1999, Eric Larson, who I mentioned earlier, established 113 Aspen plots that were randomly selected um, and are spread out throughout the Northern Range. And I started collaborating with him in 2017 and we measure Aspen in these plots each year. So here's an example of one of our stands and our sampling method. The white line that you can see running through is a 20 by one meter transect. And that has established start and endpoints that are the same every year. And within each transect, we measure um, all the young Aspen that fall within it. So height, growth, and was it browsed the previous winter. We also, an important thing to note is we don't have measured or marked rather marked individuals, uh, which can make sampling a little bit tricky and analysis a little bit tricky, but this is still the most expansive data set, both in terms of spatial and temporal coverage that anyone has for Yellowstone um, Aspen. So it's incredibly valuable regardless. And here are just a few more pictures of some of our stands to kind of give you some examples. 
you can see some are very dense and have lots of big aspen now. And then we have others that are completely empty and show very little signs of regeneration. So we compared uh, trends in aspen herbivory and height between random and non-random sampling. This plot is showing browse probability over time. So we looked at a, a decade of aspen in the park and the red line is our non-randomly sampled aspen. So just the five tallest stems. And we can see that using non-random sampling, we get a faster decline in browsing and a greater decline in browsing than we see with random sampling. And we see the same pattern if we're looking at height. So again, the red line is non-random sampling and it overestimates the amount of change and the rate of change uh, in Aspen height compared to random sampling. So this led us to uh, conclude that sampling bias has exaggerated this trophic cascade. And it's also kind of contributed to our very simplified understanding of a trophic cascade in this system. However, the random data do still show patterns both in herbivory, so a decline in browsing, and an increase in aspen height that are consistent with the trophic cascade. So that helps to fill in our first piece of the puzzle. Okay, so we've established that aspen regeneration has been much slower than previous research suggests, but there still has been a change that's consistent with the cascade. So now we wanna look at what the mechanism of this potential cascade is. And the question here is, is elk density or wolf caused predation risk the dominant driver of a wolf elk aspen trophic cascade? If we remember back to this slide, there are two pathways through which wolves could be affecting aspen can either be a density mediated effect or a trait mediated effect. We represented elk density with an annual measure of elk across Yellowstone. Um, note that this is all inside of the park because that's where our aspen plots are. So we're assuming that it's elk that stay within the park all winter um, that are doing most of the browsing. But predation risk is a little bit trickier. So there are lots of ways to measure predation risk. It's been represented um, in tons of different ways, but it's hard to actually gauge what elk perceive as risky. And so because of this uncertainty, we cast a wide net and we used uh, 10 different representations of risk. So first we looked at winter wolf density. So as an example, this is a heat map of where wolves spend their time in winter. And note that I'm, I'm saying winter because this is when it's uh, when elk browse aspen. So that's a season of interest. So we measured wolf density both as an average uh, across 20 years basically. And we also had annual layers of wolf density. We then looked at the density of wolf killed elk locations again in winter time. And this we broke into average and annual measures, uh, but we also looked at sex differences. So we have maps of all elk that are killed by wolves, but we also broke it down into just males and then just cows and calves. And finally, we looked at a few measures of topography as indicators of risk. So this map here is showing how open the landscape is with the reddest zones being the most open. So we use both openness and landscape smoothness as indicators of risk. Wolves are most successful at hunting elk in open flat areas. So that should signal the most risk to elk. So using these 10 different risk metrics, we first look at, at browsing as our response variable. So here, just briefly and, and simply, we have uh, browse probability measured as a function of predation risk and elk density. And then we also accounted for plot and year effects as well as stem height and snow. We used a separate model for each risk effect. So here we're comparing 10 different models of browse probability. And I just want to remind you that our risk measures are all spatially explicit whereas elk density is a constant across Yellowstone. And finally, we scaled all of our covariates so that you can directly compare the strength of each of them. So this chart is showing the relative effect size of all of our predictors. So each row is a different model with a different risk predictor. 
Um, and if a point overlaps a zero line, it means there's no discernible effect of that variable. So if we look at this chart, these are all the, these green dots all represent a different predation risk measure. And they're all either very close to zero or overlap zero. And we can add elk density to this and we see a much stronger effect here. Also note, if you look really closely at this, at this uh, chart, there are only two measures of predation risk that had non-zero effects. So annual wolf density and the annual bull kill density were our two significant predictors of browse probability. And we can visualize these effects a little bit more here. So this first graph is showing browse probability as a function of risk. Um, the dashed line is our predictions from the bull kill model and then the solid line is wolf density. But regardless of which one you're looking at, you see a very slight <laughs> decrease in browse probability with predation risk. We can compare this to our density effect. And here we see a much stronger, clearer signal of uh, browse probability as a function of elk density. So we established that, there, that elk density has an effect on browsing and that there are two measures of predation risk that seem to have a slight effect on browsing. So we then wanted to see if those effects on browsing then translate to an effect on Aspen recruitment. So here we're talking about recruitment as a young Aspen entering the adult population. So with Aspen, there's often a height threshold that's used as a proxy of recruitment. So if Aspen is taller than some height, we say it has or will or is likely to recruit into the adult population. And to determine this recruitment height, we modeled browsing as a function of height. And you can see it's nonlinear. So the probability that a stem is browsed increases up to about 120 centimeters. So that's the peak browsing height. That's where elk um, prefer to browse, for example. And then after this height, it decreases. So the idea is that if a stem is shorter than 120 centimeters, browsing is suppressing height. But if it's taller than 120 centimeters, height is now suppressing browsing. And the most conservative estimate of recruitment that we could take from this map is about three to 400 meters. So the idea is that once a stem reaches this height, it won't be browsed at all. Um, and then it's free to recruit into the adult population pending you know, death from other causes, but browsing is no longer going to limit it. However, we have so few stems <laughs> of this height or taller than this height that we ended up having to use 120 centimeters as our measure of re recruitment. So anytime I talk about recruitment for the rest of this presentation, just remember that it's a very liberal estimate of recruitment and really is more indicating when a stem is going to pass that peak browsing threshold. So we modeled recruitment similarly to browsing here. We have it as a function again of risk and elk density. We also again accounted for plot and year um, snow effects and we also added spring precipitation as a driver of recruitment. And we only tested those two measures of predation risk that had a significant effect on browsing, since we're assuming that browsing is the mechanism uh, that's supposed to suppress recruitment. We can visualize it again. So in this case, uh, bull kill density was the only one of the two risk predictors that had any effect on recruitment. And if you look at this graph, uh, you can see that that's a very slight change. So with being, the change in recruitment from essentially no risk to lots of risk is maybe like 1%. We can again compare this to elk density and we see a strong signal with recruitment rapidly decreasing as elk density increases. So ultimately this chapter suggests that if wolves have an effect on aspen, it's through changing elk density and not changing elk behavior. This isn't to say that elk don't respond to risk, but they're not responding in a way that actually ultimately reduces their browsing and benefits aspen. So here we determined that any wolf effects in this system will likely be density mediated, which has helped to clarify uh, the mechanism of a potential wolf-driven trophic cascade in the system. All right. So now I'm going to move on to the meaty part of this presentation where we're actually trying to quantify the indirect effect of wolves on Aspen. So here the question really is, to what extent did wolves contribute to a trophic cascade? If you remember back to this slide, we have to show three lines of evidence to demonstrate this cascade. So 
we first have to determine if wolves suppress elk abundance, and we're forgetting about predation risk for now because that previous chunk showed that there was very little effective predation risk. This we need then need to show that herbivory is reduced and ultimately that wolves indirect, indirectly increase aspen recruitment. So in this study, we are explicitly quantifying the wolf effect and we're also explicitly accounting for the effect of hunters on the elk population. And all these other predators are implicitly accounted for in the model, but we don't partition out their specific effects. The overall model looks something like this. So we start with elk uh, and they browse aspen, which is hypothesized to have a negative effect on aspen recruitment. And then when we add wolves and hunters to the system, they should reduce the elk population and result in this indirect positive effect on aspen recruitment. So this is our hypothesized relationship that we're trying to test. To actually model this system, we had to combine a couple different methods. So I'm going to try and break down all the pieces of this <laughs> in a simple way. So first, we have wolf cause mortality affecting elk survival in a demographic population projection of elk. Similarly, hunters uh, also remove elk annually from our projected population. And that means that wolves, hunters, and elk form our first submodel, which is an elk population projection. Then we link elk to aspen browsing through a statistical model that's based on empirical data of browse probability as a function of elk. So this is similar to what I just showed you in that second chunk on the mechanism. And then we use uh, predicted browsing to then model aspen recruitment. So our second submodel is elk and aspen. So finally, to actually measure the indirect effect of wolves and hunters, we first, we can remove wolves from the system. Um, so doing essentially a predator removal simulation. And we can do the same thing. We can remove hunters from the elk uh, population projection to get at the indirect effect of wolves on as or on, of hunters on aspen. So I'm going to break it down even further. So let's start with that first submodel, the elk population projection. This is a female-based age structure demographic elk model. Um, so it includes elk from ages 1 to 20, and this is our simple Leslie matrix format. And there are several different vital rates that go into it. So we can start with fetal sex ratio, which is the number of female calves born. And we get this from harvest data. We then have estimates of age-specific pregnancy probability that come from collared elk. Calf survival comes from helicopter surveys uh, that classify the elk population. So we get ratios of calves to cows, and that helps us estimate calf survival. And then we have adult survival that comes from collared um, individuals as well. To get at the effect of wolves, we have to partition wolf cause mortality from survival. So very simply, we can think of survival as one minus mortality. And here we're just breaking that mortality into that caused by wolves and that caused by everything else. So for adults, we get cause specific mortality from continuously uh, monitored radio collared elk. So when there's a mortality signal, Yellowstone technicians go out and necropsy the individual uh, remember, we're talking about females, so you can ignore, uh, ignore all the, the antlers <laughs> in this picture, but this is essentially what happens. And there's a similar process for calves, um, but in this case, we have wolf cause mortality coming from wolf kill rates of calves. So to get at the effect of wolves, we start with this baseline condition. So it's a scenario with all the sources, absor observed sources of mortality in it, um, and we then can remove the wolf effect and compare the two scenarios. So we're simulating a wolf removal experiment. And we removed wolf cause mortality in two ways. So the first was to assume that wolf cause mortality is 100% additive. And this means that when we remove wolves from the ecosystem, all the elk that would have been killed now survive. And this scenario represents the maximum possible wolf effect. The second way we did this was to assume that wolf cause mortality is only 50% additive. So here 
when we remove wolves from the system, half of the elk that would have been killed now survive, but the other half still die from other causes like other predators. And this scenario represents perhaps a more realistic um, wolf effect. The other important predator that we're explicitly accounting for is humans. So hunter caused mortality was treated a little bit differently because we had direct annual counts of age specific harvest removals. This graph shows the number of harvested female elk um, that are killed by hunters just north of the park. So it's still a single population, but they're right outside the park each year. And there are two important years to recognize. So first, um, hunt permits were limited in 2005, specifically during this late hunt, which is targeted towards females. So they were limited in 2005 because of concern that the elk population was declining. And then uh, in about 2009, 2010 season, this late hunt was suspended completely. So the, the hunt that targets females was suspended entirely. And this means that the majority of um, harvested elk um, were taken in the first 10 years after, after wolf reintroduction. Also note that we are removing harvested individuals uh, at the end of each simulated year. And this is assuming that harvest is 100% additive. And if we look at this slightly blurry graph, um, the bars are showing the proportion of female elk that are killed either by hunters, which is gray, or wolves, which is white. And the dots are pregnancy probability. This is all that, if you see the x-axis, it's all based on uh, female elk age. So what I wanna show you here is that hunters tend to kill the uh, most reproductive um, prime-aged females, whereas wolves selectively kill older, less reproductively valuable uh, females. So just like with wolves, we can start with this baseline condition that has everybody in it, and it's what we are uh, closest to what we're observing. And then we can remove the harvest effect um, to get at that indirect effect of harvest on Aspen. So I'll now briefly explain how we're linking elk to Aspen. This is similar to what we did before. So we started with browsing, and here we now have it as a function of um, female elk abundance. And we also accounted for our plot, year, uh, aspen height, and snow. And we see basically the same pattern as before. The model is slightly different. Um, but as the number of female elk in this uh, population increases, we have this increasing trend in browse probability. And then to get at a mechanistic effect of elk on Aspen, we're now modeling recruitment as a function of browsing. So we're again accounting for plot and year and spring precipitation. And we see a pretty rapid decrease in probability of recruitment based on a stem's probability of being browsed. And then to actually get at the indirect predator effect, all we have to do is compare recruitment in the baseline conditions versus our predator removal scenarios. So the difference in recruitment in these two scenarios is essentially our predator effect. Okay, so that was a rapid fire, simplified explanation of how we did all of this. Um, now I'm gonna show you the more interesting bit, uh, what actually happened. So first, let's see how the simulation actually performed. The uh, red line is our observed female elk abundance uh, total, uh, the total population, and then the purple line is our simulation. And you can see that we clearly missed some peaks and valleys, but the simulation does follow the general trend of the elk population. And then we can subset this into just the proportion of elk within the, uh, within the park each year, and we have a slightly better fit between our observed and simulated uh, populations. And if we remember back here to this slide again, we have to, the first line of evidence that we have to show is that wolves suppress elk abundance. So to do this, like I said, we're gonna compare different scenarios. So this is our projected elk population starting with the gray line or black line, which is the baseline. So this is with both wolves and hunters in it. And when we, remove wolves, first assuming um, that wolf cause mortality is 50% additive, we see an increase in our projected elk population. And we see an even greater increase with our second wolf removal scenario. 
And so because we have an increase in the elk population without wolves, it provides evidence that wolves in this case are suppressing elk abundance. And we can do look at the same thing with harvest. So when we remove harvest, the elk population increases, and that's suggesting that hunters are suppressing elk abundance. And also one thing to note is uh, you can see with this green line, the population increases um, dramatically or, or to begin with for the, uh, really the first 10 years and then kind of starts to flatten. And that, that follows that pattern of um, that I showed you earlier where most of the female elk were harvested in the first 10 years after, after uh, wolves were reintroduced. And then we can also look at this just for the proportion of elk within Yellowstone. And we essentially see the same thing. So we start with our baseline, we remove wolves with our two different assumptions about additivity. And when we remove wolves, again, the elk population increases, suggesting that wolves are suppressing elk abundance. And the same thing with harvest. When you remove harvest, the elk population goes up, suggesting that hunters suppress elk abundance. So now, so that was the direct predator elk link. Now we want to look at the indirect wolf and hunter at, and to Aspen link. And I'll again start with how our simulation performed. So this is browse probability over time with red being our observed values and purple being simulated. And generally we do capture the trend in browsing, but we actually underestimate it a little bit. And so then when we get to recruitment, because recruitment is a function of browsing, we end up overestimating recruitment a little bit. And all of this is to say that our simulation captures the general patterns of Aspen over time, but it's not perfect. So there is of course uncertainty in all of this. So we showed in that first wolf elk link that wolves can suppress elk abundance. Now we have to see if that uh, suppression results in reduced herbivory and ultimately increased Aspen recruitment. So we'll start with herbivory. Note that we are looking at herbivory just from the proportion of the population, elk population that is within Yellowstone. And this is because all of our Aspen plots are within Yellowstone. So we're assuming that it's just the elk that stay in the park all winter that are doing most of the browsing. So we can compare our scenarios again. So we start with our baseline. This is how much browse is happening with all the players in the system. When we remove wolves in both of our scenarios, we get an increase in browsing, which is suggesting that wolves suppress elk herbivory. And again, we see the same thing with harvest. When you remove harvest, browsing increases suggesting that hunters suppress elk herbivory. And then we can look at how this translates to Aspen recruitment. So we start with our baseline. When we remove wolves, first 50% additive scenario, then 100% additive scenario, recruitment decreases. So with wolves, there's more recruitment, without wolves, there's less. And the same thing happens with harvest. When we have hunters in the system, there's uh, more Aspen recruitment, you remove them, there's less. So this. Uh, simulation is suggesting that wolves and hunters both actually help increase Aspen recruitment. So to compare these effects, we wanted to quantify like the overall wolf effect, the overall hunter effect in a different way than just looking at trends over time. And we did this using the log response ratio. So this ratio is essentially a standardized way of comparing effect sizes. So you can compare uh, numbers across species and across systems. And all it is is the log of some experimental effect over control effect. So as an example, we can look back at our recruitment um, projection and we can calculate this log response ratio at a single point in time. So we would divide the uh, recruitment probability in our experimental wolf removal scenario to our control, which is the baseline. And that gets a single measure of the log response ratio. And then to get one value across time, we can just average, you can calculate that log response ratio each year and take the average of it. So now we can look at this log response ratio. This is really representing the effect size. So this graph um, is really kind of the money graph. It's showing what is the effect of wolves and hunters on elk browsing and aspen recruitment. So our blue bar is the wolf effect. If we're assuming it's 50% additive, Purple is the wolf effect when it's 100% additive, 
And then green is our hunter effect, which is 100% additive. So a bigger number means a bigger effect size. So the first panel here is starting with elk, or so our direct predator elk effect. So clearly, elk have the, or hunters have the strongest effect here, um, but it's not significantly different from the wolf effect, the purple bar, uh, when we're assuming wolf cause mortality is a 100% additive. But if we look at the probably more realistic 50% additive scenario, the blue bar, it's about half the size um, of that hunter effect. And now if we transition to an indirect effect of predators on browsing, we see basically the same pattern that hunters seem to have a slightly stronger effect, but it's not significantly different from the 100% additive wolf effect. But again, if we look at the more realistic 50% additive scenario, uh, wolves have an effect size that's about half that of hunters. Also, we see that the effect size is greater on elk than it is on browsing. And this is expected because top-down effects are often weakened as they move through a food chain. So um, we, expect, we expect that to attenuate. We expect that effect to, to attenuate. But then we look at recruitment <laughs> and that doesn't happen. So if we look at recruitment here, we see the biggest effect sizes and all three scenarios here are, are significantly different. So if we're just looking at recruitment, which really is the um, measure of plant abundance, it's really the measure of plant change that we're most interested in. We see that harvest has the greatest effect, followed by our wolf effect when it's 100% additive, and that 50% additive effect is, I think, less than half that of the hunter effect here. So these bars are showing the average effects across time but we can take a little bit of a deeper dive into this and look at um, the effects across time rather than, than average. So here's a graph to demonstrate that. This, so this is our recruitment measure again. Again, the log response ratio on the y-axis basically just means what is the effect size? So we can start with our 50% additive scenario and we see that the uh, effect of wolves on recruitment increased in time up to about 2010. And then it declines a little bit, starts to level off, um, suggesting that maybe this is the effect that wolves will continue to have and kind of hit their, their mean. Um, when we look at the 100% additive scenario, we see basically the same pattern, but it's slightly stronger. Um, and then when we look at harvest, we have a much faster increase up until about 2010-ish. Um, so as as hunters and wolves were present in this system, uh, the elk population decreased and decreased and decreased. And as it decreased, the effect on recruitment got stronger. Um, but with harvest, since it essentially ended around 2010, that effect really starts to drop off. But it takes a long time uh, before it actually matches up with our wolf effect. So if we're thinking about wolves having 100% additive mortality on elk, um, then the wolf effect became stronger than the hunter effect in about 2015 here. If we're looking at our 50% our additive scenario, the hunter effect is actually still stronger, but they're starting to converge. Okay, so in this chapter, we showed that wolves can suppress elk abundance, which did result in a decreased herbivory and ultimately an increase in aspen recruitment, but the strength of the wolf effect really depends on our assumptions about how additive wolf cause mortality is. Also, hunter cause mortality was a stronger top-down effect overall, especially during the first 10 years after wolves were reintroduced. So it looks like that hunter effect really kickstarted the elk population decline but still unknown what we weren't able to account for in this study is the contribution of other predators like bears and cougars. So ultimately, uh, this study helped us kind of fill in this final piece of the puzzle regarding the strength of the indirect wolf effect. Um, and it showed that ultimately, wolves had a weaker effect than hunters on this elk population. All right, so I spat a lot of information out at, at you all, talked about a lot of different aspects of this study. So now I'm gonna try and distill it into just a few important pieces. 
So what are the main takeaways? First, a uh, wolf-driven trophic cascade in the system is predominantly density rather than trait mediated, if we go back to our mechanism study. But our conclusions about the strength of the wolf effect really depend on our assumptions about how additive wolf-caused mortality is. Also, hunters played a really important role in triggering this trophic cascade. So without harvest, we probably wouldn't have observed the decline in the elk population that we did. And ultimately our um, simulation showed that it was the combined effects of both of these predators. And then probably the other predators that we didn't explicitly account for that resulted in the change to Aspen that we observed. And also this study kind of highlights that Yellowstone actually is an anthropogenic landscape. So we think of Yellowstone often, or at least I've always thought of Yellowstone as a protected system, right? It's a national park, the wildlife within it are protected. But because that elk herd spans park boundaries, there's actually a ton of human influence um, on population dynamics. And then finally, even with multiple predators limiting elk abundance in the system, there is still widespread uh, recruitment failure. So we can take a look at this graph. This is our recruitment measure. This is what was observed in the system. Um, and again, that's the probability that a stem is taller than about 120 centimeters. And that's really, that's just about chest height. So it's quite short. And looking at this graph, we can see that there really was hardly any recruitment up until about uh, 2009, 2010. So that was 10 to 15 years, really 15 years after wolves were reintroduced before we saw any um, significant changes in recruitment. And even now, so if we look at the last few years, even now, um, there's still relatively low recruitment. So, so this is suggesting that the majority of stems or the majority of Aspen are still at or below the height um, at which they're browsed by elk. So elk can still browse them pretty heavily. Also note that there's a huge amount of variation, this um, purple shading here, there's a huge amount of variation in how much recruitment is happening. So that means that some stands may have taken off and they're fine and they're doing really well um, and others <laughs> are not. And since we kind of were able to rule out predation risk as a reason for this spatial variability, it's probably other things like climate or site characteristics um, and just takes a really long time for in this system for Aspen to recover. All right, so that's all about Yellowstone, but this, this research certainly applies beyond that. So trophic cascades and free living systems are really hard to measure. And we often have to rely on observational data because it's hard to do manipulative experiments. It's hard to do predator removal or ungulate removal experiments. And so when we're relying on observational data, it's really critical that we're using random sampling, that we're not biasing our results from the outset. Also, the strength and mechanism of predator effects are context specific. So in Yellowstone, um, we think of wolves as the main predator, but elk are also predated upon by cougars and bears, coyotes even, um, and people. And then we also have elk as a really big ungulate. Um, but it, so really there are just so many variables that go into determining whether uh, there will be predator effects, the strength of those effects, how they'll happen, if is it a fear effect or is it a density effect. And finally, uh, our study also shows that landscape scale ecosystem effects cannot necessarily be easily or quickly reversed. Uh, like I showed in that last slide, it took a really long time to see any uh, response of Aspen to reduced elk population. Um, and so that just, that's just something to keep in mind if you're thinking about predator reintroduction, it doesn't, you might have to wait a really long time before you actually see anything happen to plants on the landscape. All right, so as I end, I just wanna highlight um, a few, just a very few of our many collaborators on this project. Um, like I mentioned, so I came into this project when there were already 20 years of data. Clearly I did not collect all of that. Um, and so it really was a huge collaboration between National Park Service and then people from um, all over the states. So thank you to everyone involved in it. And with that, I am ready to take questions. Awesome. Thanks so much again, uh, Lainey, for that really incredible talk. Um, so I do have one question, but I guess I'll open it up first uh, to anyone else if they want to unmute or drop it in the chat. Uh, I'll give a, maybe a few seconds. <laughs> 
Yeah, Craig, go ahead. That's a great talk. It's wonderful work. Um, I wanted to ask just three quick questions about um, the hunters themselves. Uh, can you remind me why you only did 100% uh, additive on hunters and not 50%? Yes, yeah, so we did 100% additive because that seemed largely because the majority of elk killed by hunters are um, what we call prime aged elk that really have incredibly high survival um, otherwise. So it's an assumption that seems to be backed by literature. Um, but we are we are thinking about should we be exploring harvest as less additive than that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed like it might be just you know do a fifty percent on them just just for thoroughness. Mm -hmm. The second one on that is uh, when did that when did they start shooting females? When did they start those late harvests? You know, I don't know the actual year specifically. Jack might know, but it's I mean before it's been that had been going on before ninety five. Um, yeah, it was uh, nineteen seventy six is when they started the late hunts, and that ran all the way till two thousand nine, and really two thousand four when it dropped off significantly. So, could you use data from nineteen seventy six to nineteen ninety five to sort of look at where it is just just hunters and no wolves are there yet? Yeah, we could you know go backwards. Um, to look at the elk population, we don't have any data on Aspen, but I mean, we could potentially project project backwards, but we could certainly explore the elk demographics there. Um, that's a, well, that's wanted, a great idea, not something we had considered. If you had, uh, if you had like aerial photos, you might see mature stands of Aspen. If did they start to decline uh, even as early as the 80s? It's just people didn't notice it yet. Oh, they certainly have. Aspen have been in decline. Uh, really since <laughs> since the early 1900s in the park yeah. in particular, and there's a lot of um, a lot of speculation about why they were in decline, but uh, it seems very much that Aspen established in the park at the end of the Little Ice Age uh, when the climate was colder and wetter and more conducive to Aspen growth, and the climate now is just not even really suitable to Aspen. So um, that could be a huge component in the decline, but certainly, yes, we could project back um, and look at that decline. Uh, you just opened a Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. so. Have, have you thought about putting climate change into your, your simulation models? Yes, yeah, so we have, so snow is a variable that's actually in there. So we use oh, um, snow each year as a predictor, no but we haven't really tinkered with uh, changing that. How, you know, how, so we've been using like observed snow. So we haven't tinkered with, um, with projecting out further. It is something that we would love to include into the model and particularly in more complex ways than just snow. Um, but yes, it is on on the to do list, shall I okay. say? Then just the last quick is just it seemed like you were doing wolves with and without, and then hunters with and without. What about both? I mean the combinations of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. neither yes, that, both. Uh, yes. So we had we did we did do with and without, um, and I've gone back and forth on whether to display that. But the challenge is that the population really skyrockets without both of them, and it's hard to really see on the graph anything else then. Um, so in terms of yeah, presenting, it's you don't really get a lot out of the visuals. But yes, we have done simulations without harvest or wolves and the yeah, the elk population really skyrockets. And we have we have a component in there that's a um, a density dependent effect for elk. Um, and we haven't necessarily seen it level off. Um, but that's something that might we might need to tinker with more. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, something that sort of reaches an asymptote at some mm -hmm. sort of number. Okay, thank you very much. That was a great talk. Absolutely. Thank you for your questions. Appreciate it. All right, uh, I guess I'll go ahead with one. Um, so kind of tracing back to this kind of random versus non-random, can you just talk a little bit more about, I guess, the motivation or the, you know, the misleading motivation of um, all the, I guess, non-random sampling work? That mm -hmm. did occur. Uh, for yeah, so, so as far as I understand it, based on the earliest papers that use that method, um, specifically the five tallest, the motivation seemed to be that there um, was wasn't a lot of change in Aspen happening, and they wanted kind of an early indicator of change. So using by measuring just the five tallest, the idea was that you would you would basically predicting what you would predict what would be happening down the line. Um, and in early papers, it was uh, noted that that was not necessarily representative of the landscape as a whole, um, and that it wasn't necessarily uh, indicative of what's happening right now. Um, but that kind of that justification has gotten lost in later papers, and it's um, just kind of become commonplace. Be and 
Uh, particularly, it's, it's used in both aspen, willow, and cottonwoods in Yellowstone. Um, and it's not, the thing is, it's not a common metric outside of this system. Um, and so we wanted, because it's not really used anywhere else, and because it really is the foundation of our whole understanding of what's happening with aspen and Yellowstone, that was the impetus for um, comparing it to random sampling. Um, and in much earlier renditions of that study, we were also looking to see if using just the five tallest, if it was predictive of what would happen, you know, five, 10 years down the line. Um, and it really actually doesn't seem to be. Um, and the justification for that is probably, you know, if you're measuring just the tallest individuals, there's a reason they're the tallest, right? You know, they're either, they have more resource availability or there's something that predisposes them to faster growth. Um, so, so it really seems like it, it isn't necessarily predictive either, but ultimately it was a, it was, I think, an attempt to um, kind of, they called it a leading edge indicator to, to figure out, to see changes um, as, as soon as they happened, kind of predict these changes down the line. Ah, did you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, I'm wondering if there are browsing heights at which elk can simultaneously browse and remain vigilant. And maybe if there are foraging really low to the ground, you can maybe only forage and not be vigilant. And if any of the changes in browsing heights might indicate some sort of change in behavior concurrent with browsing. That's a great question. So that's something we ex we thought about and explored a lot. And we were um, specifically that graph where you know we have um, browsing increases with height up into about 120 centimeters. And 120 centimeters is um, basically coincides with elk shoulder height. So it's, you don't have to bend your head down as much. So it's either mechanically and physically easier, but also potentially keeps your head up um, and allows you to be vigilant while you're browsing. So that, so, so that's kind of our hypothesis as to why that is the, um, like the most commonly browsed height. So below that height, you can also be covered by snow because this is all winter browsing. Um, but certainly, yeah, that's something we've um, thought about a lot is why are you browsing at that? that specific height. And it does seem like you would be mechanistically, you know, it's easier physically, but also you're, you're able to be vigilant simultaneously, perhaps. Great. And then it looks like we have uh, one question in the chat. Maybe I'll go. Um, yeah, let's do the one in the chat first. So do smaller herbivores have significant effects on aspen recruitment? And has there been research looking into how wolves might be affecting those herbivore populations hmm. directly or possibly indirectly through effects on other predators like coyotes? Great question. Great question. So in this system in particular, we did an initial camera trap pilot study to see, because the all of the research before we started was, you know, elk are the browsers, elk are the browsers. And we wanted to see if that's actually the case because we have elk, um, but we also, there are also bison, there are mule deer, there are a few white-tailed deer, um, there are pronghorn. So there are a lot of other potential browsers in the system. But based on our camera data, 85%, I think, I believe, 85% um, of the browse incidents that we actually like captured were, um, were elk. So I think we had maybe like two pictures of moose and maybe one of mule deer. So specifically in this system, it very much seems like elk are the are really the only thing browsing, and that and that's probably because they're the most they well, for many years were the most dominant ungulate in the system, um, and mule deer would browse predominantly in summer. But we actually we had our cameras out year round, and we didn't see that we didn't see any seasonal um, changes. So so our cameras both show that elk are browsing in winter, and elk are the dominant um, the dominance here. Outside of Yellowstone, you know, white-tailed deer, mule deer certainly um, certainly have an effect on aspen mule deer in particular. If you look at, there are tons of studies in Utah of Utah aspen and mule deer, and they they are the, the dominant ungulate there that are um, contributing to failure to recruit, recruit and failure to regenerate. Um, so yes, certainly in other systems, it doesn't seem like it's that other ungulates are a big thing here in Yellowstone. Um, let's see, what was the second part of your question through uh, other predators? You know, we haven't seen, a lot of, uh, I haven't even really explored much with other predators um, like coyotes. Uh, so that's something that we could certainly potentially look into later. But thank you for that question. I think I answered it. Great. And then uh, James, did you want to go ahead with uh, your question if you had one? 
Yeah, thanks. Um, that was a great talk. Um, so it reminds me a little bit of my um, my dissertation work back in Yellowstone, which is ages ago now. But um, I, you know, I was looking at how um, coarse wood and and wolf density might be related to uh, aspen height and browsing densities. And <clears throat> one of the things that that we found, um, we were sort of looking all over Yellowstone, though. It was that one elk don't seem to care about coarse wood at all. <laughs> they, get, they get everywhere, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and they also browse everywhere. But um, although the maximum height seemed to be related to um, predator density, where higher aspen were found at places with more wolves, it was also related to elevation. And so, you know, since the, um, you know, w one thing that was interesting about the Aspen is that there was that big recruitment after the 88 fires mm -hmm. that really hadn't been seen in a really long time. So you're seeing Aspen, you know, sprouting in places that they hadn't been seen in, you know, like a hundred years, I think, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering now, you know, I was doing my work back in the early aughts and I'm wondering what you see now up in those higher elevation plateau areas. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that was a place where we were seeing less or taller growing trees. Um, as opposed to down in the, the lower Lamar Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, just another comment I would have is that I remember one particular observation was that finding this, you know, heavily browsed aspen everywhere, like just stunted and like, you know, knee height or whatever. And then one perfectly fine aspen that was maybe, you know, full leaves all around and maybe, you know, four meters tall, but like really leafy and luscious, untouched by elk, mm -hmm. which indicates that there's probably a lot of like individual selection for uh, palatability. And I wonder how that's, ha how much that's affect recruitment um, after all of that sexual reproduction that happened um, across Yellowstone. Anyways, mm -hmm. I'll listen now. Thanks. Yes. Well, I love hearing your, um, your observations from earlier in the in this study period of ours because yeah I was looking at Aspen essentially 2016 to 2020 so yeah I guess 10 to 20 years after after you were looking at it and um so regarding elevation we have tested elevation as a predictor and it's um doesn't seem to be significant um as a predictor of recruitment in terms of actually seeing it on the ground though, I can like envision, um, I, can, I can certainly envision a bunch of our stands that are at higher elevations, specifically on plateaus that have tons of regeneration, but then there also are a lot that have none. So we haven't seen an elevational effect there. Um, and then uh, what was the second part of your question? Um, looking at, oh, so, so the, yeah, the differences where, where we have so many shrubby <laughs> short hammered aspen and then you have some that are just like absolutely fine and whether we've thought a lot about secondary compounds we wanted initially we were going to try and do um a secondary compound analysis to see if that was one of our one of the driving forces of these differences and in, in terms of uh whether aspen these aspen are are less palatable um but fe <laughs> feasibly what we actually we talked to rick lindroth about that who does a ton of aspen secondary compound research and the feasibility of hiking, you know, 15 miles in the backcountry and collecting leaves, and then you'd have to preserve it on dry ice. It was anyway, it just wasn't feasible, <laughs> feasible to do uh, the, like the way that we would need to do it to get at that. But we, we do think though, that, you know, the Aspen that has survived with all this browsing that are really shrubby, um, that, well, there's a trade-off between having those defenses of secondary compounds um, and growth. So the ones that are still surviving, um, you know, they they might be developing these secondary compounds, but it means that it's going to take longer for them to be able to grow into the into the overstory or even into pole-sized aspen at all. Um, but so yes, secondary compounds slash genetics, another whole can of worms <laughs> that needs to be thought about and accounted for um, and kind of highlights the whole simplicity of, of even what I talked about today where we're looking at wolves and other predators as potential instigators of these trophic cascades but there are so many um, alternative hypotheses competing hypotheses and competing drivers that need to be accounted for um, that largely largely are kind of left out of the picture um, that was a bit of a rambling but just to your point Yep. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. By the way, Rick also talked me out of doing secondary compounds for my PhD. So his legacy continues. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs>
Awesome. Um, so it looks like we're a little over. Do we have any last minute questions before we uh, head out? Great, thanks. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again, Lainey, uh, for another fantastic talk. Um, and yeah, join us, uh, everyone. Thanks for coming. Join us again next week for uh, another Kansai seminar. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.